Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Founders Business Society and this week's edition of Expedition Business. Today, we have the privilege of talking to Wayne Divinage, founder of OTA, and most people probably know him as a person who were brave enough to take on the government to get rid of ETOLs. But since the ETOL saga started, OTA has also embarked on being a fully-fledged civil action society. And Wayne is probably the person who can write the book on civil actions and how to affect change, because we so easily forget that change against the government is possible. But without further ado, let's give a floor over to Wayne. Thank you. Thanks, Christelle and Isabel. For, for the invitation um, to, I think, just share uh, the experience that we went through and and um, and and the takeaways. There's there's a lot of learning that has come, and this job and journey doesn't stop. Uh, it's constantly evolving. So um, let me just go back and 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 and, and explain why what happened uh, with the etol issue. Why was etols a, a, a matter? Well, I just happened to be um, in that space uh, of fleet management. I was the CEO of, of Avis at the time, the biggest private purchase of cars outside of government in the country. We had about 9,000 vehicles just in Gauteng alone. Um, and, and, and I chaired the several uh, industry body that, uh, uh, that looked after the car rental issues. And and to cut a long story short, when we heard shortly after 2020 that that government um, uh, had these plans to start tolling uh, the freeways that they had already uh, upgraded, largely upgraded from 2008 to 2010, just before the World Cup, they were going to finish it off after the World Cup. Uh, it was about 80% done by then. Um, we we learned of government's plan to subject the Harting motorist to an electronic tolling system. It's a drive now, pay later scheme. You could never put gantries up on the freeways because all you do is create more congestion. And the, the purpose of the upgrade of the freeways was to reduce the congestion. So uh, we were quite surprised when we heard about this plan. Uh, and, and initially we said, well, we need to engage. Nobody knew about it, by the way. Nobody knew when they announced that they're, uh, in about October 2010, that they were ready to launch in 2011. This was going ahead, um, and the people were confused. The public were confused, politicians were confused, unions and business. Um, and so we believed that the scheme was going to impact on our business. And when government introduces schemes that impact on business and on society's lives, uh, it, they need to be very careful not to do so in a, in a way that is negative, that uh, that adds more cost, that adds more complexity, uh, and 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 that's why you have public engagement. And they didn't do that; they failed dismally at that. So so we spent the next year, from 2010 right the way through the end of 2011, engaging with Sanral uh, constructively, trying to find the solutions to the scheme and its impact on, on, on us, on society, on business. More so at that stage on our business dealings. And, and the more we engaged, the more we learned uh, about A, an organization that was arrogant, it was blinded to the pitfalls that lay ahead. Uh, it had a plan and nobody was going to get in its way. Um, and B, we could see that the scheme had all the hallmarks of failure. Uh, that it wasn't going to work, that it was going to become a fight between government and its citizens. And you don't want to live in a country where where you're at war with your with your citizens. Uh, it just doesn't make good for uh, you know the compacts between society and government and the harmonious relationships that have to happen. Uh, and the more we dug, the more we saw the gross uh, abuse of power. And this scheme, besides the fact that we paid two to three times more than we should have for the road construction, and that was a lot of corruption and collusion that took place that came out in a competition commission review, um, 
uh, a lot of money was made, which shouldn't be made there. Uh, the, the actual tolling scheme was where the money was, the big money was going to be made. Uh, the tolling scheme is the one that charges you and I collects the money and manages the system. And, and, and the money that they collected was supposed to go and pay off the bonds that they borrowed, the 18 billion rand to build the road, which shouldn't have cost, as we say, more than six to eight billion rand maximum. So now you've got to pay off a bigger bond uh, and, and, and the collection scheme was going to pay first themselves, ETC, the electronic tolling company, which was owned by Cups Traffic Com, an Austrian-based company, uh, was going to first pay themselves for the collection process. And then the balance obviously goes to Sanrol to pay the bonds. Well, that's where things started to really go south. What we learned was that Sanrol had told us and told government that they'd signed this winning tender with ETC at 6.2 uh, billion rand for a five-year contract. Meanwhile, we found out in court that they had actually signed it at 9.9 .9 billion. Now that's before one rand goes into the tarmac, 9.9 .9 billion rand for five years, of which uh, the vast majority of that was not just infrastructure and systems, but it was it was the operating expenses. Uh, and that's about 30% administration fee to the tolling schemes collections. Uh, the worldwide average is between 7 and 11%. And so you can see the picture that's being painted here. How do you get billions of rands or millions of rands offshore into the hands of the wrong people? You do it through these types of schemes. So it was a scheme born in sin, it was a scheme that was going to make a few people very, very rich, and we were going to have to pay for it as citizens. So, so we had to make a decision, this business. Um, you know, after spending this year trying to convince government this was a bad idea and seeing that they were not going to relent and stop, and it was a case of literally, it was a case that told us it's our, our way or no highway for you car rental guys if you don't part, participate and and do it the way we want you to do it, then we're going to make your lives hell. We're going to kick your cars off the road. And oh, it was, it was, it became messy. So we had one more option, and that was to go to court and to have this decision reviewed. And that that required a two-part process. Part A was the urgent interdict. Now they said they were going to launch throughout 2011. They couldn't. They didn't and they couldn't. They just weren't ready. But they did say they were going to launch on the 30th of April uh, 2012. And and we had a very short space of time to put a, a case together to convince the court that this needed to be stopped, reviewed. So the urgent application, which is part A, uh, we bought, uh, filed the papers throughout the first few months of 2012. And we went to court and we convinced Judge Willem Prinsloo that he should stop the scheme uh, while we reviewed it with the courts and reviewed this decision in a longer court challenge, which is part B, reviewing the decision. Um, we won that urgent interdict. We convinced the uh, judge that this should be stopped. And that just that win put a lot of wind into the sails of civil society. It was a it was a massive blow to government because and I think a big upliftment to society because it showed that civil society can win, can challenge government and win. Um, and, and, and then the next part of the case, it became very, very technical. And the long and short was that uh, the courts don't want to interfere with the executive powers of government. And they were basically saying, look, if government makes mistakes, if government makes bad decisions, they're allowed to. This is what it is. And, uh, and But the biggest thing that was in Sanrol's favor is the money had already been borrowed and the roads had been built. So we were not privy to stopping it. Uh, they allowed Sanrol to continue with the tolling scheme, but they also opened the door. Firstly, the first judgment was a very poor one. It just ruled badly. We had to go to the Supreme Court of Appeal to appeal that. We also got a massive cost order against us, uh, which was government's cost order. And 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 the, courts, the court erred there because there's a biowatch principle that says the court should never rule against civil society on government's costs because it just puts the fear into other civil society challenges against government. We should be allowed to challenge government without suffering the costs, unless we were vexatious and wrong. And we weren't wrong to challenge us. 
So the Supreme Court did throw out that cost order, which was a godsend for us because we didn't have any of the money. By then, we owed the, our, our lawyers four million rand on this court challenge, and um, and 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 we, uh, you know, the court then opened the door and said, "Look, if if you want to bring as individuals now a collateral challenge, in other words, you can challenge this decision if the scheme is unworkable for you as an individual, you can't participate." Uh, it 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 had so many other flaws. Then then bring that collateral challenge later. But let Sanral continue with their decision, bad or not. So we had a decision to make. You know, do we do we pack up shop? We have no assets. We uh, as Arta, we uh, we needed to make a decision to move on with our lives. Um, you know, this wasn't making us money. We were not earning salaries. There were three directors. Um, uh, trying to support society. So society was struggling to support us. Business ran away, by the way. After that, uh, those court decisions, we still had to fight this. But um, but government lent on business heavily and got them to capitulate and stop funding ARTA. So we had to make a decision. And and what we heard society saying, please keep fighting this. Uh, and, and our decision was then, well, we will fight this, but on one condition, we we have the funds to do so. If we're going to defend society when Sanral starts summonsing the public, we have to um, have money to do so. And this time around, we can't do this on one-off donations. We're going to have to employ legal people. We're gonna, we learned a lot. We didn't want to make law firms rich. Uh, uh, which is what normally happens. We wanted to build our own uh, legal team to fight these uh, um, summonses that were coming and take up the mandates on behalf of the people and and um, and 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 do what has been done successfully in this type of civil activism fighting, which is uh, in the Group Areas Act. It is one case at a time until you win. Uh, and 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 Gilbert Marcus, uh, you know, educated us. He's a senior counsel and said, "This is how they fought the Group Areas Act." And on the fourth case of an individual tech, they're going to court to say why they were not going to carry the dom pass around and be subjected to these irrational laws. That the fourth case was the win that every other case thereafter was the precedent for, and and the Group Areas Act collapsed. So. You know, look, we're in this new democracy and you think your government uh, is introducing rational policy. But when it is so gross and so irrational, uh, and these schemes, by the way, the Z-Tone scheme around the world, our research showed, unless the public support them, unless the public have the buy-in, uh, it, it doesn't work. They fail. They don't get to the compliance levels that they should. They need over 90%. But when it goes below 80%, it fails. It failed in Portugal, failed in Texas, the Edinburgh, and many places. And where it works, the money is not necessarily plowed into the upgrading of the roads. It's plowed into giving citizens alternative public transport options so that if you and I could take a bus and a train to work and it was safe and on time and reliable and clean, well, we might do so. So that's how you remove congestion from the road. So where it works is where, is where there's good engagement and the costs are low and, and the public buy-in. Well, none of that happened yet. It also needed a very accurate registry, a vehicle registry system. Ours in South Africa, Natus, is very inaccurate. And finally, it needed a good, efficient postal system. Well, I don't have to tell you about that. So, so here we are with a scheme that was going to be forced on society, uh, uh, looming, and, uh, and, and the court challenge now allowing them to proceed uh, and civil society saying, well, what do we do? We had to make a decision. If we're going to fight this on behalf of civil society, we need civil society's buy-in. And we need them not to pay, give us one-off donations because we need to employ full-time people. This now becomes a, a, a job. This becomes a business, but it's a non-profit public benefit organization. So it's non-taxed. Uh, so it's not your typical business, but we can't pay salaries once off or annually. We need to we need to employ good people. People don't work. These systems, these schemes, these entities don't work well on volunteerism. Of course, there are a lot of volunteering NGOs out there, but this fight was going to require um, expertise and and longevity, it, and it needed the right people. And if we're going to fight Sanral in court, we need money. So we said to the public, we'll continue to fight this on your behalf on one condition. 
you sign debit orders. Uh, we can't be prescriptive. We're not a legal wise, but but go onto our website and help us. And if we've got money, we'll fight in your corner. This is about fighting for the little guy. This is about defending you, the citizen, the small businesses, the medium and big and bigger businesses as well. Um, and 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 uh, but we we just can't do this on thin air, uh, and we need to employ the right people. So. So we didn't allow people to give us one-off donations. We we had to be hard on that issue. And we had learned for the first three years, we, we tried to fund our court cases through these one-off donations, and it doesn't work. So we said to the public and business, rather than give us a 1,000 rand once off, give us 100 rand a month. And, and keep that open-ended and stop it any time you want. And small businesses, you decide. Uh, give us more. Give us less. It doesn't matter. Just Just fund us. And we will do whatever we can. And we knew this was a long fight. And we knew we had to stay the course. And so that started to bring in the funds. And as Sanrold started issuing summonses to the public and threatening them with criminal action and uh, and, and, and and no licensing of their vehicles and, and bad credit ratings, oh, the, the propaganda machine was massive. We had to fight that back. Uh, we had to put out anti-propaganda we had to challenge their claims and we got a lot of insider information from whistleblowers that told us that our case our fight was right our numbers our projections our estimations was right uh sanro was lying to the public uh and and we had to counter them with 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 uh, uh, you know propaganda uh, in, in the same way that they were trying to fight with propaganda so we called them out all the time it was headlines almost weekly this detail matter and as people were being summoned, people started to support Ada, come on board and say, will you defend? And we said, sure, uh, you know, but tree, please donate. Uh, and, 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 and our funding grew to the extent that we could. We could now employ more and more people to take on all these cases. And, um, and in 2016, we got asked, why just details? And at that stage, you know, state capture was in full swing, headlines every day in Kandla and so forth. And so we said, if, you know, again, if we have funds, we will build our team to start tackling government, taking government on, head on. And, uh, and, and that's what we started to do. So with this team that was fighting the uh, ETOL uh, summonses, uh, where there was some capacity, we started to engage with whistleblowers. We changed our name from Opposition to Urban Tolling Alliance, which was uh, what Arta stood for then, to Organization Undoing Tax Abuse. We amended our MOI. Uh, we filed everything with SARS. We became Section 18A certified so that people who do donate to us uh, uh, can claim those funds back uh, through tax uh, rebates. And and we started to engage with whistleblowers on corruption matters. Uh, I mean, within weeks, we stopped the BNP capital deal of millions of rands flowing through Dudum uh, delinquent processes at SAA. We had we, we lodged our claim to have a declared delinquent, which was successful. And so we started to play more in the space of taking government. We laid criminal charges against politicians, against people in government. Some of those only coming to fruition now. Mosa Ben Zizwani case for one is was based on our work. Uh, he was the minister of mines and energy at the time uh, and doing a lot of wrongdoing, uh, supporting the Guptas then. Uh, the the transnet cases with Brian Malefe, Anush Singh, a lot of that information come from our cases as well. They're now in court. Uh, so, you know, this fight uh, against corrupt politicians, it's a journey. It's a long one. We didn't know whether Zuma was still going to be in power by the end of 2017. He wasn't. Um, that should have changed things, but Ramaphosa has been very weak. Uh, we are captive. We're held captive by a government now that is in the throes of political infighting. Uh, and, and, and our nation is trapped right now in this, in this absolute mess um of 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 the anc who who just is unable to do the work that has to be done to enable uh, you know economic growth in this country because it has been everything related to how much money can they suck out of the system and the etel scheme was one of those by the way we believe there was a lot of money going to flow uh, offshore into the pockets of of, of connected people so the long and short of the ETOL matter was we knew 
We knew that we would win this. We would wear government down so long as we we got citizens to stand their ground and to defy a bad law. And that is our obligation as citizens. But you must remember, road users in Gauteng or any part of the world are generally middle class. Middle class South Africans don't like to fight with government. They don't, they they fear, they fear the, the fact that they will uh, not be able to get their licenses, that they might get arrested, because those were the threats. So it wasn't an easy it wasn't an easy uh, um, thing to do, but we we had to just convince the public this is their fight, and if they stand their ground, we will win this. We'll win it through wearing government down, and we'll protect them in court. We'll cover all the court costs. And when you give people that um, assurance, uh, they get brave, and they get bold, and that's exactly what happened. People said, okay, I'm not going to pay. Uh, they start discussions with their friends and family, and, and everybody's not paying. So, well, that's good. The more of us that don't pay, uh, the more government's going to struggle with this. And I think, uh, you know, 2014, a year into the launch, they could see, we could see, we got the numbers. We could see that the compliance levels maxed out at 40%. Now, earlier on, I said, these schemes need 90% compliance. And Sanral, we're confident they'd get 90%. Well, if you don't even get 40% of users paying, uh, then the scheme is doomed. And 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 we milked that. We messaged that out there. We said we're winning this fight. And the more we did that, the more people stopped paying. Uh, and we showed them why we were going to win this case. Then Sanral's threats of summons as we we just fought every single one. We responded to every thousands of them were coming and they thought they would wear us down. But we had a really good process to just uh, take on every mandate and handle every court uh, uh, case as if it was going to be a court case. To the extent that the courts came and said, we can't, we can't have 3000 court cases on this. Uh, so we said, fine, let's do a test case. And we were a long way down the road with Sanral and preparing the test case when the 2019 elections came up and Sul Ramaphosa tapped Sanral on the shoulder and said, this fight that you are having with citizens is not right. It is not good for politics. It is not good for government. Please stop summonsing and threatening and carrying on with like you are with citizens. And that was the start of the end. The minute they announced they were going to stop summonsing the public, then that was when the death of Etals uh, was uh, born, the real death. Uh, it took them since March 2019 to October this year to make that final decision. Then um, that's because politics got in the way and it, uh, they just are un incapable of making rational decisions. And and I think there were a lot of people that, uh, that were still enjoying some of the revenue. Instead of 300 million rand a month being made by ETOLs, it was only 50 million. And people were still tapping into that revenue stream. But the end was now, and it's now here. Uh, and and, and uh, this is a case of citizens have power. And if they use it bravely, uh, and if they stand up to bad law, we win. And this is how you win. Uh, now, we're very fortunate in South Africa. We've got a free press. We've got social media. And we've got active citizenry. If we tried to do this in Zimbabwe, we would have been taken out. If we tried to do this in Turkey... Uh, and other countries in Venezuela, we would have been taken out. We would have been assassinated. Our systems would have been closed down. We would have been harassed. So those are the fortunate pluses that we have uh, in our favor as a country. We can challenge this government. And this has been one of those wins. And there are a lot of others that can and should happen. R2 is one that we are fighting. R2 is another ETAL thing. It's an absolute mess. It is government trying to build an empire that's going to make a lot of money out of traffic fines on a national basis. And I won't go into that now. Uh, stopping the car power ships deal, which we did in court, we're currently in court on. That is, the, that is the, uh, we estimate now, before before the, the Ukraine war, it was about 220 billion rand over 20 years was going to flow into this Turkish uh, ships uh, energy deal. Well, that's probably 500 billion now. Uh, Gwede Mantashi is pushing this. That is not good for this country. It is the worst decision that they could make from an emergency power issue. And yet they 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 want to continue to force this down our throats. So we have to fight these things. 
So I think when you look back and when we look back at Arta, we've given birth to this organization now that has no fear. It challenges government. It will lay charges against government. And what we wanted to do as an organization is not just be another NGO that exposes because the media does that. Uh, a lot of NGOs uh, expose. But the problem is with just exposure is the headlines today and it's gone tomorrow and they carry on. And we saw that uh, throughout Zuma's rule and Dudu Mnyeni was in the media for the wrong reasons, but was continuing to be a direct on various boards. So we said, if we're going to be a civil activist organization, we need to intervene in a methodology that holds government to account, that doesn't just expose. So we put a five-step methodology and we investigate. So we have to employ investigators. We investigate properly. We get the facts when we meet with whistleblowers. Then we engage the powers. We we tell them, look, this is what we know. You know, do you want to engage with us? Do you want to tell us what's going on here? Um, are we reading it wrong? And 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 normally they fob us off and they ignore us and they because they are wrong and the whistleblower's given us good information. Then we expose them. But not only do we expose them, we move into a fifth, a fourth a dimension of mobilization. We protest, we let all other oversight bodies know what's going wrong, uh, and, and we put pressure on wherever we can. And then the last step is litigation, which is very expensive, by the way, even though we've got our own legal team and we save costs. You still have to go through law firms. So we work with smaller law firms, which are cheaper because we do most of the work for them. And we work with senior counsel that give us good rates. Um, so we do keep the costs as low as we can, but it's still expensive. I mean, just having Didum Nieni declared a delinquent director cost us 5 million rand. 5 million rand in three years. Uh, they wear you down. They come back at you when they've got money. Government comes back. They bring interlocutory challenges and cases within cases. Uh, and that's why civil society generally fails in court. But we decided to build this war chest, this legal war chest with the surplus funds that we had so that we can fight fast and quickly and have the funds. Because you can't, for instance, car power ships comes along. You can't say, okay, well, let's try and raise money and then six months' time go to court and challenge them. You've got to lay the cases and the charges very quickly uh, to stop those decisions being made sometimes. So so that's what we've literally done. We, we, we now have 45 staff. We've got investigators, project managers, legal specialists, and communications. Communications team, our comms team, is, is, is a 10-person strong team out of that 45. Social media, writing media statements, all our media statements we do about uh, average one to two a week on the various cases that we are fighting. All of them get traction. Uh, Arta is probably engages with our various spokespersons on TV, ENCA, uh, um, you know, SABC News and, 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 and the Newsroom Africa and that at least once a week you will find uh, one of our spokespersons uh, being asked to come on onto television and news to, to, to discuss issues, driver's licenses, the list is long. We've taken on 230 projects since 2016 when we expanded beyond ETALS. Some of them are quick, some of them happen quick, some of them are long uh, to take years and cost a lot of money and that's why we need to employ professionals that stay the course of time with us uh, because volunteers are here today and gone tomorrow as they get other opportunities we need uh, professionals that are paid market related salary so it's not cheap it costs us uh, over three million rand a month to run this organization so how do we fund it well we fund it through as we've said donations uh, it's citizens, uh, it's small businesses, and uh, and and they log on and they and they donate, and and we have to keep reminding people. A lot of people say, "Well, what's what's my hundred rand a month going to do?" Well, if everybody had that attitude, we wouldn't have any money. So collectively, and and, and crowdfunding is so powerful. Uh, we've got some companies that give us uh, fifteen thousand rand a month. Big fleet companies that love the work that we do, but there's few of those. Uh, and, 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 and it really is the tens of thousands of individuals. Uh, and we say to businesses and we say to, to individuals, you know, if an organization that's doing anything in the fight against corruption uh, and being effective at it, as it, at it is worth anything to you, then surely the cost of a, a hamburger and a, and, a, and a beer a month is worth donating uh, to, to, to Arta. 
Uh, and that's that's how we just try and get more and more people on board. So we need we need support. We shouldn't have forty five staff. We should have one hundred and forty five staff. Uh, we are uh, we have no more positive cash flow. We are we are tight at the moment, and it's sad because um, you know we we when we engage with business, we do sense a fear to support civil society. We don't understand it. Well, I do largely because of being there. Understand that business. This is our issue with business. I know we're all busy. We don't have time for this. So our view is, well, then help, then then spend very little money helping people who are doing this work to fight corruption. Because if we don't, if we don't fix corruption in this country, we will have no country to do business in. And business leadership, I engage with their leaders and, and others uh, very often have said, you know, they have switched their focus. Now, they, they've raised this issue of, Economic policy is one thing we need, but unless we fix corruption, corruption is the biggest de deterrent to growth in this country. Unless we fix that, we're going to have big problems. So we, this country is in turmoil. This country is in a state of depression. This country, businesses, uh, you know, we here, yeah, we've invested. We can't go. We can't leave. So we have to fix. And what does that mean? Well, it means that as citizens, we become active. As business leaders, we become active. We stop thinking purely of shareholder value and we think of stakeholder value. Stakeholder value includes your staff, your communities, your surroundings outside your sphere of business. Uh, and what does that mean? And we need business leaders to start unpacking that. You know, how do we fight? How do we get involved in the fight against corruption? And if we don't have the time, then why don't we support those organizations like ARTA, like Corruption Watch, like Section 27, Helen Suzman Foundation? There are a number of us that do this work, uh, but we cannot do it without the donations and without the support. Uh, and, and really, that's all it boils down to. Uh, I'll give you another example. We are challenging the DTI uh, on NRCS, the National Regulatory of Compliance and Specifications. It's an archaic process. It's a it's an empire. They've built lots of lots of money uh, being made, uh, salaries being earned on in very archaic, outdated processes. Uh, business has to challenge this, uh, and businesses struggle to challenge it. They ask us to come on board and fight it. So we said we will, but we got we got no more funds. We got to have to employ a a person, a specialist in this area, 60,000 rand a month is what this costs. Will you fund this business? Now, these are big businesses directly implicated and, and will save this country a lot of money collectively if we, we can fix this problem. Uh, and yet they struggle to fund it. And we ask why? Why is this, why is there this notion that you shouldn't be supporting or you can't support civil activism? So I think we've got to get our minds around that as business leaders and realize that if we don't, if we don't fix it, if we don't fight, if we don't challenge government head on and stop having this unfounded fear, uh, then we're going to struggle as a country. So I think that's, I'll just, I'll, I'll stop there. I hopefully set the scene, maybe a number of questions. Uh, hopefully there are, and, uh, and, and, and let's take it from here for the rest of the show. Unmute. Thank you so much, Wayne. Um, well, I can just think of a number of questions, but I see a couple of faces that are eager to ask you questions. So let's open the floor for questions. Mm -hmm. Great. Any questions? Yes. Good morning. Hi. Um, my name is Isabel Fenter. I'm a final year law student at Tux, um, and I'm very interested in tax. So this is quite interesting to hear about and listen to. Um, I'm wondering when you're looking at tax abuse and starting to investigate a new form of it, what are the starting signs? Is it always corruption or are there other things to look for? Yeah, so, so uh, I mean, there's a, uh, you know, in keeping our name, Arta, when we change it and try to keep that acronym, uh, it, our, our space is not, although there's a lot of tax abuse when it comes to businesses abusing the system and not paying tax, that's not our space. That's Sowers' space. They've got to go in there and, and try and close those loopholes. Our, our, 
our business is fighting the abuse of our taxes by politicians. Um, yeah. They pay the checks. Now, it doesn't mean to say that it's only government that's involved in corruption. Business is the other side of the corruption coin when it comes to doing deals with government. Um, but but because it's government that holds the checkbook and makes the payments and does the deals behind the scenes, those are the people that we go after. It doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't go after ABB and uh, SAP and KPMG and McKinsey when they, they're involved as well. But if we put enough pressure on the powers that be, they bring that pressure on the businesses as well. And the NPA picks up the cases and we and we give them as much information as we can. We've got hold of the Gupta leaks. We've got so much information there. So, so the long to, to cut that response to that that question short. Uh, if our mandate is purely on that space, the abuse of power and misspending money, then that's where we focus. Uh, but we also, we, you know, it's not just about corruption. It's about introducing. And they do it very well. Lawful systems like R2 and ETOLS was going to be one of those. They introduce schemes that make a lot of money for government. And our question to the DG and Treasury and others is, why do you, why do you allow this continuous additional taxation that comes up? You know, you should be able to get your license provided for you free of charge by the state but yes there's administration fees so you have to pay 250 rand to get your driver's license and to get it renewed but how, how do you bring those costs down instead of going up and they keep going up um so this whole r2 uh, uh, traffic fund management it's a massive money making scheme i'll give you another example the long distance toll concessions there's nothing wrong with public-private partnerships on the N3TC, Bakwena, or track routes to Mpumalanga and KZN. They build good highways, they maintain them. But what happens when there's no transparency is the revenues go up because the whole environment in which, the, when they gave those contracts to those companies over 20 years ago, there was a lot of freight moved by rail. It's now moved onto road. Those tariffs have gone up uh, inflation related every year. The money those institutions are making is massive and public private partnerships are not set up to profiteer to they, they, they're allowed to make reasonable profits, but not excessive profit. And they've got to be transparent. So we ask center on the government, how much money is made by these concessions on these routes? And they won't tell us. They won't give us all the, any of the information, not one bit of information. So we're now in court to get information that you and I are entitled to. Now, that to us is abuse of systems and taxation because there's, there's no transparency. We believe there's a billion rand that should be due to government from that, but it's going into the hands of private companies. Uh, and when government doesn't want to be transparent, you must smell a rat. So that's just one example of many, many. And then we... And then we uh, and these gross inefficiencies in so many areas, we just say, you know, fix it, reduce. Why do you have uh, 300 people employed in an organization that if you did it differently, in a government organization, that if you did it differently, would only have 20 people because the administration is so simple when it's online? Well, they don't want to do that because there's massive amounts of money to be made. Contracts that feed into keeping those entities alive, the, 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 the catering deals, the guarding deals, the, it's just so much. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made by connected people. So when we're a very inefficient paper-based government uh, that doesn't want to improve efficiencies. Uh, and then you get connected catered employment and uh, it just goes on and on and on. And if you look at the amount of tax that is being sucked out of the system, uh, and then you look at the salaries that are paid and you look at the contractors, by the way, contractors is a big, a big issue. Uh, our money is being wasted grossly. So, so the efficiency of government and the, and the efficiency of government spending is, is where we do a lot of our focus. But again, it's like, there's this iceberg, we're touching the top, but there's so much down here. And uh, our biggest frustration, our biggest frustration is that we turn down Every week, multi-billion rand corrupt deals just because we don't have time. And they are good well, transactions to title. We just don't have time. 
That's frustrating. Oh, that's incredible. Um, I have one more question. Do you think there's something to be said about the ethics of these big five top tier law firms that um come up against you when it's so clearly um wrongs that are happening that you're trying to fight? You know, those law firms have got a job and a duty. You know, they get approached by government departments to defend them and fight their cases. And um and 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 you know they will be convinced by the the factors that those institutions bring to them. So we we don't we we can't belittle or or, or talk them down. I mean every case is there's two sides to a case and government and those lawyers that defend them sincerely believe that that they've got to uh, challenge uh, a civil society. So it doesn't wor really worry us um, at all. Uh, what worries us is the ethics sometimes of big law firms and law firms. You see it all the time. I mean, you just have to look at the road accident fund, how it is being plundered by, because there are loopholes and the, the strong law firms go in and, and they get these settlements um, and they're, they're abusing those positions. Uh, we've decided not to use big law firms because uh we've seen it you know let me give you an example the the etol case we were told by the law firms that this isn't going to cost you more than a million rand we weren't even out of the urgent application that's part a there was still part b to come and then interlocutory challenges and so forth. we weren't even out of the uh, 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 uh urgent challenge and we and they had billed us for three million rand so so we were in, in debt and I started to learn that, you know, the law firms tend to perpetuate these matters. They, 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 they tend to invite and, 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 and allow these interlocutory challenges to come on board. So now uh, that's why the Dudum Yeni, there were four interlocutory challenges that were bought. Uh, and the people that have the money get the big law firms and they wear you down. So the little guy gets worn down. And that's why civil society just struggles. We're very fortunate we've got a litigation war chest and we'll fight back. Um, but that's not the case with most law firms. So there is an ethics issue when it comes to law firms and how and what they take on and challenge. But I suppose it's their prerogative and they believe in what they're doing. And yeah, we, we have a different picture of law firms. I can tell you that. And it's a, not a good one. <laughs> Chaz, you've got a question? Okay, yes, thank you so much. Um, good morning, Wayne. Uh, thank you so much. You've, you've done an awesome job. Um, I think it takes more than resilience to, to have done what you guys have done. So that's absolutely amazing. Uh, it's a bit disappointing that there's, I actually expected this webinar to be quite, you know, chock-a-block. <laughs> but anyway, it is what it is. Um, did you not attach costs, um, you know, the fact that they they they've plundered so much money did you guys uh, attach costs for them to sort of pay you back for all the fees that you guys have um run up yeah so on the etol one uh we're waiting for the we have to wait for the final decision once the decision to stop tolling it's i think it's coming on the 31st of this month um that's when we go back to san roll and their lawyers and say okay we have been subjected to millions of rands of costs we're coming we want you have to settle those and and we're going to obviously enter into negotiation otherwise we're going to go to court have those costs taxed uh on the dudumnyeni matter yes we have had the costs taxed and we are going after her right now as we speak uh, the sheriff is in her properties uh attaching goods but she owes us millions and they're very clever. They they move those assets out. She's got very few assets. So we're going to have to sequestrate her. Uh, and hopefully that will trigger her to get funds from her Gupta and Zuma mates. And they owe us that money, millions of rand. So in all these cases, um, we've been successful. We've uh, only lost one small case in 2016 against NERSA on some decision. But uh, all our cases are successful because we, we do it properly and we take on the right fights. Uh, so we will get we will get those funds. But it costs money, you know, just taxation bills and then the, getting the sheriff of the court to go and attach goods. You lose a lot of that money as you go along. But <clears throat> for us, it's not about making money. We're a 
for a non-profit entity, obviously we want to get as much back of those costs as we can, and we do, but it takes time. It's going to take time to get this money back from Senral uh, and government on the on the uh, car power ships. They just don't want to give us any information. So, uh, yeah, on the on the on the ETO, on the long distance tolls, we uh, you know we've won those cases. Uh, the interlocutories they have to pay us. Uh, services CETA, we took the, uh, them on and uh, won that case to get information. You know how much time we spend just trying to get information mm -hmm. from government? We have to go to court very often because this PIA, this Public Access to Information Act, is just abused by government as well. So eventually you go to court and we win and they pay us uh, money um, because they have to. But it takes time. It takes a lot yeah. of time. Yes, we do get our money back. So what can we sort of as ordinary citizens do to assist? Um, I know, I think earlier on you said you guys came up with a strategy of sort of people paying a, a smaller amount monthly. Is that working? Is there something else that we can do? Is there any other research from other countries um, that would, would assist uh, the cause? Yeah, look, it's... it's, it's um... Civil society can, there's, there's, there's two ways you can go about funding. It's crowdfunding, or you get donations from big philanthropic uh, fund, funding organizations from the EU, uh, based overseas locally. There's the Wraith Foundation, Millennium Trusts. Uh, there's a lot of that, that, that support uh, um, uh, organizations like ours. But very often those are project specific and they have an end and the money dries up and they don't like to fund civil society organizations that are spending money on court action. They prefer to fund organizations that are doing good in other areas, whether it's uh, uh, feeding schemes and schooling and, and education and so forth. And those are good. Those are, so that happens. So, so we don't get much funding in, in the way of, of, of big donors. And it's very, it's dangerous because when you get to the end of the project, You've suddenly got people employed and you have to let them go because the project's ended. Ours is a continuous case. So crowdfunding is the is the preferred mechanism and it works. Um, so all we can say to, to individuals and businesses out there is never think. I think Edmund Burke said it, the, the biggest mistake is made by by people who think, well, I can only give a little, so I'm just not going to give anything. Just uh, uh, that's the worst mistake you're going to make. It, it is a case of the more we get people to donate and tell their friends and family and have this conversation around, well, if you're moaning about corruption, if you're frustrated with it, what are you doing about it? And if you are doing something personally and involved, that's great. But if you don't and you don't have the time and you're telling us that, you're telling me that well 100 rand uh yeah, okay if you can't afford it that's fine as well a lot of people just can't afford 100 rand man. and we and we accept that we understand that. but you know we've got uh just over twenty thousand supporters and we should have a hundred thousand supporters think about how many just taxpayers out there uh whose taxes are being abused but I guess not everyone knows about us. We can't assume everyone knows and B, that we need this funding and that we are crowdfunded. So our challenge is to keep telling the story, to keep getting more and more people to understand that that supporting causes in the fight against corruption is, 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 is a good thing. But people support other causes, you know, support uh, um, SBCA and other good causes. So we're all stretched uh, and we just got to make decisions. Uh, so the only thing I can just ask and plead is that is that um, is that come on board because when you support us as well, you get our newsletters, you 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 get updates on our various projects, so you can see what we're doing uh, as well, and it's nice. It's it, we get the feedback we get from our supporters is that they are active citizens just by supporting us, and they have decided to take some of their funds and 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 be active by working, getting a salary and saying, I'm going to support uh, active citizenry in this way. And supporting us is, is the only suggestion I can give. Uh, we we get sometimes requests, well, can I help you in doing financial analysis and this and that? But when we engage with, with, with volunteers in that space and we say, right, now we need this done by this date, well, they're not always available. Uh, and then they can and they can't. It's hard to work with that. So we... 
we rather find full-time or temporary project managers that work full-time on some of these uh, projects, and but we have to pay them. So yeah, support us if you can uh, is the only thing I can suggest. And get your friends and family to do the same. It takes five minutes to yeah. join us. I'm, I'm just wondering who I should chat to because I know of an organization uh, the, that South Africa, in South Africa that could assist in terms of projects without um, you guys having to pay, um, as yeah. well as um, of a marketing person that I could assist in um, looking at. Because for me, I mean, it's just supposed to be a no-brainer. The, the, it should not only be 20000 And I think it's just getting the message out there. Um, so you let me know who to chat to and, and try and see from mm. a project perspective where the projects, um, you don't have to pay for that, as well as from a marketing perspective, marketing perspective in terms of just getting your good work out there um, right. and getting more people to, to subscribe. So if you drop uh, uh, through through yourself, Christelle, the uh, mail, it's, it's wayne.duvenage at Arta. Um, without the H in Duvenage, uh, .co.za. But Christelle's got uh, my email address. I'll put it in the chat group here as well. Feel free to just mail me, and then I will set the ball in motion uh, with uh, our comms and marketing department. Just quickly, Wayne, um, you've mentioned the whole communication team. You've got 10 people on board, which sounds like a whole lot. Um, yeah. But still, after all the work that you've done so far, a lot of people are not aware of all the amazing mm. work that you're doing. Together with all the other um, amazing organizations that are out there, and you've mentioned it, and you're not shy mm. to say that they are doing also brilliant work. Each one just have their own specialities. But um, in general, people still have this notion that, or, and I'm talking about more the people on the ground, that the country is going to pieces and there's nothing that they can do. And they're all making plans to leave the country in drones. Um, how do you get through to those people that seem to just want to keep on complaining and not be open to solutions? Yeah, it's 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 not easy. So look, we market as much as we can. There's more social media marketing. And we just don't have money to to do TV ads and radio ads and billboards. That's the conventional stuff. So it's mainly through social media, viral campaigns. But not everybody gets to see them. Our team is full time. Twitter, uh, you know, social media posts. Uh, we got 145,000 people just on our Facebook. Page. Facebook is throttles your communications right down. Uh, they, 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 the algorithms. They try and prevent organisations like ourselves. It's strange uh, in using its own database of of supporters in in Facebook. We, you know, if we put out a communication, not all doesn't go to one hundred and forty five thousand people who support us. It's, it's weird unless they log on. It doesn't keep popping up. Um, so, so you know, just writing our media statements, two to three of them sometimes a week as a full-time job for us. We've got a writer. We've got somebody looking after our websites, updating it. We've launched two other products where we've got a full-time person marketing those, which is a, a, an app that helps citizens report infrastructure breakdown in municipalities. Uh, that's taking shape. Water Can is another initiative we've launched where we're getting citizens to test the quality of our water and rivers around the country um, because government's failing. And so we be saying, well, if government doesn't do it, citizens can do it. And we're introducing a very exciting program there. Um, and and it's, it's difficult to get the information out there uh, unless people are joining us and sharing the news that we share with them on our websites and through our newsletters. Uh, it really is... Um, uh, those that team, our comms team and marketing team, are, 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 are full time uh, in just developing content. Uh, but that doesn't get to everybody, and we know because people are so busy. So I think I think for civil society, just society in general, it's hard to say don't go um, when when you can go and you don't believe there's our solution. We believe what is coming. Uh, especially in 2024, our re new reality is going to be coalition politics. We're paying a lot of school fees right now as, um, as, as the various opposing parties to the ANC grapple with how this is done. 
and how it's done properly. It's the first time we're entering into it. We're in Italy, Japan, these countries have been living with coalition politics in Germany for, for, for years, decades, centuries. But it's coming. It's going to become our reality. And 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 our latest campaign we launched yesterday, Be the Boss, um, on our website, you'll find a video that tries to get people to understand if you don't if you don't like all the any of the parties, you can't adopt this attitude of of I'm not going to vote. You have to vote. Uh, yeah, it's you've fought hard for this, and if you vote for the least bad party. The party that you that you can resonate maybe the most with, but not entirely with. Uh, what that does is, if you get the election rate up, the uh, the turnout rate over sixty percent and up to the sixty five, the research shows that the ruling party's percentage comes down. And we believe if we get that voting turnout up to those levels, even an ANC and an EFF coalition will be below fifty percent. Now, if we get that right and we get coalition politics, that is the start of, 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 of the good things that can come to this country and the prosperity that will flow. But it's going to take a lot of hard work. We need to have those conversations. We need to, we need to talk about them. Uh, I'm very positive about the future as much as I know. It, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, we're in for interesting political dynamics. But the one thing we do know is you can't leave the people in charge of the solution who created the problem. The ANC has created this problem. They're a party that has got no focus or intention on serving the interests of society and the people. It serves itself first. And it is broken. It needs more money because the corruption taps are being turned off. And it is vociferously trying to find more ways to make money for themselves. We have to take them on head on and we have to keep laying charges against these uh, corrupt individuals. It's very interesting times, Wayne. Um, I'm certainly supporting you. And from my side and founder's side, we will definitely get the word out on our platforms and um, try and get as many people as possible to, to join your organization and give donations. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. So at outer.co.za, it's, it's that simple. There's a join now button. It literally takes five minutes and, uh, and you will feel, you will feel active. I can assure you, you will feel proud. But thanks for, for that, uh, Isabel. No and, to the team and, and let's go out there and make a difference and fight for this country. And I think also the whole message that to change the perception that it is possible to change, that... Um, yeah. You don't have to sit you on can. your little island of complacency no. and think it's somebody else's problem. And that's the big one of the issues. You're quite right, Christelle, is that in our neighborhoods, we build our walls higher, we gate ourselves off, uh, and we don't realize that across the river and across the railway tracks are people that don't even have roads, sewage is flowing through their homes. And we've got to reach out as communities and we've got to become more organized and challenge the the poor service delivery of our local governments uh, um, and 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 again there are individuals in every community that do this work find them and support them as well give them some time and uh, and, and make a difference in your residents associations community associations business forums it's a lot of work good work being done thank you so much it is such an immense privilege to we know that you are extremely busy and to afford us the time to come and talk to us um, we really really appreciate it and as Isabel said we are definitely going to make sure that as many people know about the amazing work that you guys are doing and um, yeah right. that it is possible to affect change and then yeah. we don't have to just feel sorry for ourselves and think yeah. there's nothing that we can do because there is a lot. Lovely. And to you and your team and your various individuals and your businesses, good luck and have a safe and uh, a good uh, Christmas break or year-end break uh, as we hit the new year. Lots to do. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank and thank you, everyone, you. that joined us today. We will get to everyone else that... Um, did not miss out <laughs> <laughs> but yeah we will make sure the message gets out wayne thank you so much and everyone All else see you hopefully next week <laughs>